Look at this face, boys and girls. This is Henry David Thoreau rocking the neck beard. It's no wonder he was the king of social distancing. And we're going to explore chapter two of his uh, epic nonfiction text today, Walden. So without further ado, I'm going to walk out of the screen, try to find the remote just like in real class, and unfreeze this. And we've got some comments that some people made that I thought were pretty interesting. He says, I took it far as my price at any price, mortgaging it, to, mortgaging it to him in my mind, and put a higher price on it. took everything but the deed of it. Um, and as Hannah pointed out, I need a pointer. I think this will work. I decided to use this today as my pointer for the boys. As Hannah pointed out, he's completely oblivious to the price. He's passionate about life. He's passionate about living. But he doesn't really care about the price, and he doesn't really care about ownership. And this accentuates, as Aiden pointed out, how important farmland is to him. Um, and Peyton agreed with this. He focuses on farmland to the point that he would do anything to obtain it. But the thing is, he'll only do anything to obtain it only in his mind. Only in his mind. He has no problem laying out the land far in advance. He has no problem envisioning you know, what this land is going to look like. The only thing that he doesn't feel obliged to do is actually purchase the land. In fact, he says at the end of that first paragraph, a man is rich in, I'm sorry, a man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let alone. So wealth is not accumulated based on possessions or property or anything like that. It's what you can let go of. It's those things that you don't have to have. You might like them, you might appreciate them, you might love them as he loved the farmland, but if you can let it go, then that shows true wealth inside. Also reminds me of that vine with the lawnmower flying, you know, out in the distance. If you love me, let me go. Okay, um, so let's go further down here to the second paragraph. Um, I never got my fingers burnt by actual possession. As, as Katie, notice the ladies are really bringing it here with the annotations. Uh, he's never settled down and bought his own place. Um, <coughs> Casey had the funny comment, yeah, mom's basement is, is pretty cool. But when you think about it, how do you get your fingers burnt by possession? We saw that with Chief Seattle. White people, according to Chief Seattle, believe that they can own everything. They can own trees, they can own land, they can own air, they can own water. That's not true. In fact, Thoreau will say later, it runs on you. It owns you, uh, especially when it comes to the railroads uh, later on. Um, he brings up wives. Uh, Jaden says that not everyone feels that they need someone to depend on or have life to their side in every waking moment. Peyton Young pointed out that you can obviously tell he has a great image of wives and how they behave. Yeah, right. Um, he's about to make progress on the deal with this guy, and his wife puts the kibosh on it, and he says, every man has such a wife. But, you know, the boys start their plans, and they start, you know, coming up with things. And the wife says, no. Okay, it's called the Deborah factor, for those of you who like everybody uh, loves Raymond. Uh, something Piper points out is it makes him seem like a rather generous individual. He considers the fact that the man wasn't rich and could benefit from the extra money. He decided not to uh, refund the deposit on the farm. He decided, you know, uh, I gave him my $10 as deposit. I ended up not going through with it, but it's all right. And I'm not going to take my money back. He can have the money. I don't need the money. I need my peace of mind. And I think that's something that's very key to Thoreau in our world today, it is having, uh, as the band Boston would say, that peace of mind. I'm going to skip down onto uh, the next page. 
Uh, Brianna point out he recognizes the fact that he can afford to lose the farm and his payment. He is selfless in giving up what is rightfully his. He, he, he should get the $10 back, but he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. Um, well-being is infinitely more important than your bank account. And, and this is something that Thoreau anticipates. We're in the middle of the 19th century. We're about 30 years away from the robber baron, but Thoreau can already see the initial outbreak of this financial pandemic that is just grab as much stuff as you can. Who, he who dies with the most wins. And Thoreau sees it and he starts seeing it through the railroad, which is pretty insightful, pretty insightful on his part. I'm going to skip all the way to paragraph seven now. Um, he doesn't want an ode to write an ode to dejection. As Will pointed out, he wants to brag about the purchase of his new farm. Not really. Justin did a good job correcting Will. If you possess something that others would be jealous of, why wouldn't you brag about it? It means a lot to him. That's kind of missing the point as well, gentlemen. Um, his only purpose is uh, attempting to see to get his neighbors to see, as Adriana points out. At first I thought this was Elias, if you can zoom in on that, which you can. Um, attempting to get his neighbors to see what he sees. He is waking up the neighbors. Okay, His only purpose is to wake up the neighbors. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit here. He wants to wake his neighbors up. If he can wake his neighbors up, then he will have accomplished something. Um, if we go to paragraph 9, um, and now it's hard to see the comments because I zoomed in. He lived a very sporadic life. He has various, various styles of life. He's lived in cabins. He's been sequestered along with birds. And he's comfortable with all of it. And that's the thing. Can you be comfortable in your situation? It's like Cheryl Crow says, it's not having what you want, it's wanting what you've got, even if what you've got is just about nothing, okay? Um, he mentions a Hari Vansa, uh, and Eric pointed out, does the use of the word bird symbolize nature as a whole? Absolutely, Eric, and a boat without birds is like meat without seasoning. I found myself neighbor to the birds, not having imprisoned one but by having caged myself uh, near them. And I'm trying to find, Ren had a good comment on it, but some other people did too. He juxtaposes humanity's common practice of caging his friend wildlife by carrying him, uh, characterizing himself as being entrapped. And that's a great insight to point out. He doesn't mind being entrapped in nature. He's actually quite fine with it. Uh, it adds seasoning to his life. It adds spice to his life. It adds variety to his life. He's got no problem hearing the birds, hearing the water, and everything else. And think about us in our lives. We buy machines, and we plug them into the wall so that we can go to sleep without hearing the air conditioner, without hearing the, hearing the heater. It's marked, so they're both running, without hearing the noises from outside. We view nature as noise. He views it as his surroundings. Uh, and he loves being, uh, to use a phrase from George Costanza, totally ensconced in nature. Okay? Uh, I'm going to try to go through some comments here. We have one from Elias and Piper. He has very vivid language. It helps the readers. And that's, that's again, one of the reasons we teach this is so that you can write like a writer. And Elias noted that it's uh, typically like that throughout. Um, and that's the key. That's one of the reasons why we read people like Emerson and Thoreau. Not just for the content of the ideas, but for the vessel that they shape that, con that content in. in. In Thoreau, you get such vivid language, but such realistic language. Emerson is a little different. It's kind of like Plato and Aristotle. Remember, Plato is way up here. Logos, Eros, Thumos, three parts of the soul. And Aristotle was like, happiness. 
justice, wisdom, okay? Much more practical. Thoreau is like that with Emerson. He, and he, you see it at the end when he talks about not having a nylometer, but a real meter which in the age of reality television sounds kind of cheesy. Uh, but he wants a more realistic outlook on life. And I think uh, the, vivid, the vivacity of his language does an excellent job. He talks about the, prompt, the pond, um, an eerie feeling of some supernatural property. Absolutely. It was of the most value. Isn't it? His best neighbor was the pond. And not just because, you know, the neck beard, nobody wanted to be around him. But his, his best neighbor, he talks about the true blue coins from heaven's own. Those are the glints. Those are the glints of light on the pond. And there's a kind of tranquility that he finds here. Not just by like, oh, nature, let's go hug a tree. No, just to sit out by the pond, relax, think, contemplate. Right now, Will Whitley's saying, mount. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, he says, it's well to have some water in your neighborhood. Not on your floor, but in your neighborhood. To give buoyancy and float the earth. He talks about the earth as being not continent, which means contiguous together, but insular. Otherwise, how do we keep butter cold? Back then, they kept butter cold by burying it under. So he sees earth as being an insulator of our hearts, our minds, our souls. And if you're not connected to it, you're missing something. If you're not connected to that, you're missing something. I'm not saying you got to go out in nature every day and live the mouse life. But he says it is well to have water in your life. It gives you buoyancy. Okay, Eric asked the question, why is he giving us these tips? Seems rather trivial. No, it's not trivial at all, Eric. It's giving life buoyancy. It's raising life up by having water nearby, by having nature nearby. It insulates your spirit. Um, Jay says, he says, even the small things matter in life. And I think Jay really gets it there. Um, that something as small and seemingly trivial as water um, can actually elevate you um, more than more than you could imagine. Uh, some comments in Jaden said that most people imagine things you escape through reality of the world. It could be truly crucial things in one life that are constantly stressed over one by the reality of the world. We need an escape, and this is you know what Thoreau talks about. He needs this escape. This is why he went to the woods, so that he would come down at the end of his life, and, and he didn't want to come down at the end of his life and realize that he had not lived. And we need those escapes. We need those breaks to give us perspective, to give us balance, and kind of float buoyantly to the surface a higher understanding. He went to the woods because he did not want to come down at the end of his life and realize that he had not really lived, okay? And I think Jaden hits the nail on the head. That's why we imagine things. It's like C.S. Lewis said. It's why we populate the heavens and the earth with gods and goddesses. It's why we have mythology. It's why we have the Odyssey, which, by the way, I'll be sending you an assignment on that pretty soon. We read the Odyssey, we read the Bible, we read fiction, we read literature, we read the Hunger Games, we read Harry Potter, because we need to get away. And maybe we can't, especially with this lockdown order, you know, maybe we can't get away. But we can escape. Okay? We can ch it's not like Hotel California, where you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. It's the opposite. And we, we do this so we can liberate our spirits a little bit more. If you go down to paragraph 14, every morning was a cheerful invitation to make my life of equal simplicity. And, and Eric has a, a, a brief but very powerful comment here. Uh, he treated every day as an opportunity. Do we do that? When you're in quarantine, when you're on lockdown, when you're in self isolation whatever you want to call this, temporary, and it is temporary, this too shall pass this temporary frame of living right now. 
Is it an opportunity? Is it an opportunity? I was reading a book uh, about Jimmy Valvano. And I read a story about how when he went on his first date with his wife, he didn't have enough money. She had to call her dad to pay for the meal. That made me think and it made me laugh. And then I read about how on the day he gave that speech, he threw up over 50 times. They sat him down in the chair. He passed out. It was time for him to go up. They helped him up the step. They woke him up. They helped him up the step. All of a sudden, he gets up there. He's on for 28 minutes and gives the greatest speech in the history of sports. And he gets this back down. And he passes out. Eight weeks later, he died. That made me cry. In three pages, I was able to laugh and think and cry. That was a full day, as Jimmy would say. But let's get back to Thoreau. Renew thyself completely each day. Do it again and again. Okay? Um, that's one of his best. Peyton had a good comment on this. This is the life to live. Simplicity makes everything easier on yourself, but not for convenience sake, for peace of mind. The hard part is maintaining simplicity. You know with your writing. You try to do so much, and you don't get anything out sometimes. It's when you simplify it, you focus on this, you focus on that, you focus on some other thing. Purpose, argument, exigence, whatever you want, counter-argument, tension. But when you try to do it all at once, it just comes out like regurgitated oatmeal. But if you simplify things in your mind, you're much more powerful as a person when you do that. Okay, every morning was a cheerful invitation to make my life of equal simplicity. And Eric, uh, you know, hit the nail on the head. It is totally an opportunity. Okay, um, we have a little bit of a reference to the Odyssey here. Uh, but at the, in the middle of paragraph 14, he talks about, um, I'm trying to find it. Oh, well, dar let darkness bear fruit and, and prove to be itself to be good. Katie said, darkness can serve as an escape from the unnatural way of living. Absolutely. He wants to wake up to a more pure and untouched world. He says, that man who does not believe that each day contains an er earlier, more sacred or rural hour has despaired of life and is descending a darkening way. You've got to be aware of that darkness. It can bear fruit if you have the right attitude. And as Georgia points out, he wants to wake up in a more pure and more untouched uh, world. If we go to paragraph, um, at the end of paragraph 14, he says, it matters not what the clock says uh, or the attitudes. And Katie pointed out that men, well, I can't find it now. It's a conscious, I'll use Ren's comment instead. It's a conscious effort of the making the hour we awaken the best it could be. It doesn't matter what the clocks say. Morning is when I am awake and there is dawn in me. It's 8.21 in the morning right now. I am awake. There is dawn in me. But it doesn't have to be at 8.20 in the morning. It could be at 10 o'clock at night. At 1.45 in the morning when I was reading that story about Valvano, I was fully awake. It was the middle of the night, but there was dawn in me. And that's the thing. That's the attitude. We give such a poor account of our day. It's because we're slumbering. We're walking through our lives as if we're slumbering. As Justin points out, it's due to the fact that they sleep through their lives and nothing eventful actually occurs. It's like Billy Madison, the people who float through their lives like useless lumps of crap. When they awake, they decide not to embark on their own odysseys. And that's something we learned from that story, too. Every journey Odysseus takes, he takes ownership of it. He takes ownership of it. Even if it's forced upon him, he makes it his own. Will you do that with your life? Will you take ownership of the adversities that you have no control over? Will you take ownership of the situation? that you didn't put yourself in. You had no control over it, but you're in it. 
What are you going to do about it? And life's all about that. Life's all about that. You know, you think it's tough now. It is. But life's full of those adversities where you don't have any control over it. And your wife's pregnant, and the kid comes out three months early, and you're living in the hospital day to day to day. You don't have any control over that situation existing, but you have control over your response to it. And by controlling your response to it, you have control over the outcome. And you can make that outcome positive. I think if we simplified things, as Thoreau said, we can accomplish that. Uh, I'm trying to think who commented on this, but I love this line here. Maddie said that he believes that people must become more eager to learn. Absolutely. Not by mechanical aids. Take that, Rosetta. Uh, but by opening our eyes to understanding, as Carter points out, the truth of our world. And not to fall into other people's falseness. How important is that? As Jay would say, facts. Excellent point there that Carter made there for the boys. Um, we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake. That is what he wants. We need an attitude. That's how he wants to wake up the neighbors. Give an attitude adjustment. Not mechanically. Not by drinking a crap load of coffee any, every morning. Hold on. But by infinite, look at that beautiful phrase, by infinite expectation of the door. How are you going to react to this situation? You're going to wait for that day when it's over. I got my teacher outfit hanging on the door for the next day we're in class because I believe this too shall pass. Infinite expectation of the dawn. If you don't do that, you're a slumberer. And they call those pieces of wood underneath the railroad sleepers because it's like the people who sleep through life and float through life like wor worthless lumps of crap, like Thoreau's talking about here. And he brings that up later with the railroads. All right, paragraph 16. I want to see, I didn't check who commented on it except when I graded it. Piper says he looks to nature to learn. Uh, rather than live with fear about dis being disappointed with the world. Hey, if you want to be disappointed for the rest of your life, look around. <laughs> you will be if you choose to be, okay? I wish to live deliberately, okay? I wish to live deliberately, okay? Uh, as Georgia said, did the world teach him? I hope it did, Georgia. I really hope it did. To learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Amen. I did not wish to live what was not life. I didn't want to live a fake life. I didn't want to live a dull and boring life. Living is so dear. I didn't want to practice resignation. I didn't want to practice giving up. Okay? Unless you have to. Okay? He wanted to live life to the fullest, as Elias said. I'm, I'm glad Elias didn't put YOLO in there. And make it worth remembering. But he also wanted to practice was a necessary, hard balance. And man, Spartan-like simplicity, okay? That's a hard balance. They were historically bred to fight and be the foot soldier. His attitude is to fight and be honorable in the combat of daily living. In waking up each day, choosing to infinitely expect the dawn. That's hard to do sometimes. It's hard not to be depressed when you're looking around. But maybe if you look within and you find the right things to look around at, you can infinitely anticipate the dawn. Uh, something Peyton pointed out, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Okay. Um, Adriana says she's never heard a person argue for poverty and sound credible. Still haven't. Nice burn. Um, but simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. He wants us to simplify, simplify our lives. And maybe that's why we have so much drama. As Brianna pointed out, he seems to believe that simplicity can actually bring true happiness. So you see what we've got here in our little odyssey of a course? We got Plato telling you, if you want to be happy, you got to be just. You have to have the well-balanced soul, logos, 
Eros, Thumos. You have C.S. Lewis telling you you have to see the potential for divinity in every single person you meet. That kind of connects to that infinite expectation of the dawn that Thoreau talks about. You got Aristotle telling you the chief good is happiness, right? You got Jonathan Edwards telling you the chief good is realizing you're going to burn in hell, boy. Okay? And here you have Henry David Thoreau. And he is completely out of left field. He's completely out of left field. The chief good is simplify. Don't make your life like a journey of degeneracy. Don't have so much clutter in your life. That's his whole point. That's why he went to the woods. A mile out of town. So he was completely isolated. On Walden Pond. In a cabin that Emerson let him live in for a year. Kind of like Annie Dillard lived in a year. Uh, lived uh, a full year out on Tinker Creek trying to be the new Henry David Thoreau. Keep trying, Annie. Uh, but simplify. Simplifying your life. That's the key. Getting rid of all the crap you don't need. And going just to the essentials. What's the most essentials? You've got to determine that. And if you wake up infinitely expecting the dawn, you'll have an infinitely easier time of doing that. He talks about the railroad, very famous part of paragraph 17. We don't ride the railroad, it rides on us. We let, he's not saying technology is bad. He's not saying innovation or industry are bad. He's saying the way we look at it. We let it control our lives. I don't know how many times I've seen people get upset over stuff that's on Facebook. Read their account. Well, no, I want to know the bad things they're saying about me. Why? So you can feel bad about yourself? Delete it. If I put a C if I buy a CD, I know that's a dated reference. If I buy a CD and I put in the CD player and I hit play and it stinks, I'm throwing it out. I don't need that in my life. And that's exactly what Thoreau's saying. Look at the farm. A man is rich by what he can have, but choose not to take. And that goes back to that whole theme of simplicity. Let's go to paragraph 18. I want to see what you, uh, I want to see who commented on this. Okay. Um, he's talking about the guy on the Washito River. He says, never dream in the wild that he lives in the dark, unfamous, mammoth cave of this world, but has but the rudiment of an ice up. I like Justin's comment. How depressing to know that the world is just dark, demeaning, and lifeless. The only light in this world is yourself. I think that's maybe one of the flaws in Thoreau's argument, that he turns inwardly, and just like Emerson, sees ourselves as the only light. And, and, and as we know from C.S. Lewis, and as we know from Plato, and we know from the Odyssey, you can't be your own light. You can try, and it can help you, but there, there's always some kind of force or power that's, that's greater than you that can serve as that light. We see that. What was it, the C.S. Lewis, what am I supposed to be? A never-ending light bulb? Uh, yeah. That's what glory is, partnership with God. We see it in C.S. Lewis. We see it in the Bible. We see it in the Odyssey. And we see it in My Name is Earl. As karma is the chief good there. I love the transition. For my part, I could easily do without the post office. And Casey says, I'm slowly liking him less and less. While I understand the want to disconnect, he should just disconnect. He has a choice to. He does. Now, this is chapter two. There's like 14 chapters of this book. So eventually he does disconnect. He's making a bigger deal than what he is. Yeah. I see he's writing a 300 page book about it. Um, he talks, he rants about the news. If we read about this and we read about that, you know, good God, why do we need any more? Um, Aiden pointed out that he goes from subtle dislike to complete hatred for everything humanity's influence. Represents. I think that's a, a limitation in Thoreau's argument that Aiden astutely points out here. That this intensity, this, uh, this intensity of all this bitterness 
does it really, does it really help him? Okay, I'm going to skip all the way down now to paragraph 21. Um, where he talks about the children. And we've got a comment from Adriana. Children who play life or house or family do so based upon what they see. They don't discern anything. Uh, Thoreau would disagree, but I think she makes a valid objection. Children who play life discern its true law and relations more clearly than men, who fail to live it worthily, but who think they are wiser by experience than is by failure. I, I think his point here is that uh, older people tend to think they know everything there is to know about life just because they've been through it and not based on any objective uh, criteria. Um, let's go to paragraph 22, get some more comments. Let us spend one day as delivery as, as nature. Here's one of Ren's comments. Nature is the perfect embodiment of the present times. Maddie says people need to stay focused to learn and succeed. Amen. Uh, Peyton says he wants people to excel with a strong, stable mind without the complications. I think Peyton really gets, they all, those are all excellent comments. I think Peyton really does a great job pointing out that we're, we're too complex for our own good. And, and we need to simplify things. She kind of sees that overarching thing. Let company come, let company go. Let the day control itself. Don't try to dictate what it does. Man, we do that all the time. We try to rush everything. We try to force everything. I love what he says here in paragraph 22. Be it life or death, we crave only reality. Carter says that the challenge is not knowing what the reality is, but believing and following it. You might believe that for you, your reality is one thing. But if life is telling you otherwise, you have to adjust it. You have to adjust your vision. And then maybe it takes you a little longer than you want to, to get to that point you want. But you've got to believe in reality. You've got to follow reality. You've got to acknowledge reality, which is a big problem that Thoreau has with Emerson, just like Aristotle had with Plato. Um, we constantly crave to learn the facts of our world, where we came from. We seek out the elements of reality within the unknown. Be it life or death, we crave that. We crave that. And I think that's what keeps him going. And I don't think that it's necessarily a simple thing. It's maybe the most complex thing that he says. Okay? Um, in paragraph 23, time is but the stream I go fishing in. I love that line. Um, a fishing is a very casual way to end this, but a sort of melodic. And I love the focus on language. Time is his donate. Time is his environment that he surrounds himself with. But time is but the stream I go a fishing in. It's a folksiness there, and it's a simplicity of expression which is exactly what he wants us to embrace. He wants us to embrace that simplicity, and by God, or in his case, by Harivamsa, his language reflects that. I drink it all, but while I drink, I see the sandy bottom and detect how shallow it is. I'm always looking at the detail, okay? Always looking at the detail. He's always regretting that I wasn't as wise as the day that I was born. I've always had troubles with that line, but apparently Will Whitley did not. As we go through experiences, our perception of the world shifts, making everyone subjective in their thoughts in a certain degree, thus eradicating honest wisdom. We reject honest wisdom in favor of our own subjectivity. Excellent job. Thank you, Will, for explaining something to me that I had uh, troubles with in this piece. Very insightful. Okay. Uh, last word on this from the crusher. Our intellect helps us cut away at the cover that hides our answers that we desperately want. That's a great way to sum that up. It helps, it, our intellect helps us cut away at the facade and really get down to the real basics, the real meter aspects of, of living. 
One last thing. When he was talking about women earlier, uh, and this was kind of an unfortunate tragedy in our comment, Peyton Walker accused women of being gossipy, and none of the boys pounded the desk or said facts. I thought that's a nice little humorous way uh, to end this presentation. And just remember, if you want to be the king of all social distancing, all you need is a pond, a cabin, and the world's most epic neckbeard. Simplify, people. Have a good day.